There's a party this morning. Were you invited? Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts gathered here be acceptable in your sight, our rock and redeemer. Amen. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. There's lots of anointing in the lectionary for today. Uh, We're anointing Daniel, we anoint in Ephesians, we anoint in the New Testament scripture. There's a lot of anointing, a lot. Psalm 23 is the psalm for the day. Uh, Each lectionary has four scriptures typically, Uh, and each of them speak of anointing. So it must be pretty important, right? Uh, we're talking about da- about Daniel, about David today, not Daniel, um, and what happens when God shows up, right? So there's a party. There's a party. They're going to do some anointing. They're going to find a new king. Everybody's invited. Let's see what happens. So here we go again. Uh, We're watching God provide for the welfare of the people again. Last week, we talked about the deliverance from Egypt. We talked about deliverance from Pharaoh. We talked about manna and water from heaven and earth, respectively. God has provided deliverance, food, and water. God provided land for the people to live on. God provided guidance and leadership in the form of Moses, who, remember, was happy leading sheep, but stuck with the people because that's what God put in front of him, right? God is providing. And in the lectionary for today, God's not letting us forget that God is providing. In the beginning of the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel, we read, I have provided for myself a king among Jesse's sons. Literally, God has and continues to provide no matter the consequences. And the Hebrew here that's translated into the English as provided literally means to see. I have seen it. The key to the story. God has seen the people's need before they're aware of it. And God, as God has done in the past and as God will continue to do in the future, God is venturing ahead of the people. God is almost, almost the author of the story that has yet to be written. And you and I, we all know that God's guidance is rarely as clear in the moment as it is in hindsight. Yes, I know it's true for me. While we may not sense what God is doing in our midst or how God is leading us, we know God is there providing a roadmap to help us get to the destination. Not leading us like puppets on strings, but giving us options to see the next steps forward. That's called process theology for those of you out there who are interested. God not telling us what's next, but giving us the free will options to choose. Even the prophet Samuel did not know what God was doing, what roadmap was ahead of them. This story, like much of the Old Testament, affirms God's providence and it operates beyond the spectrum of our sight, though we remain in God's view. God goes ahead of us, showing us where we might go, always giving us the choice to take a different road to get there. In this scripture, we see that God's eye is on the whole of the people, not just one person, not just one small group, It can be easy for us to take scripture and to pull out of it what it means for us and just for us, for our lives, for the lives of those around us. In the text for today, we note that the community of faith is what is under God's care. And friends, that can be scary to those living under God's care because David, he's not in line for anything. David's the youngest. David's the shepherd. He's the youngest brother. He's not the oldest. He doesn't come from a line of lineage or royalty. David becomes royal because God speaks it into being. Jesse brought each of his first seven sons before Samuel, eager to see who would be anointed as king. They were all invited to the party. They were all invited to the sacrifice. When the eldest son, tall and fair, passed before Samuel, Samuel thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before me. God's response is one that we hold and has echoed through the ages. 
don't look at his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. The Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So Jesse brings the next two sons, Abinadab and Shammah, to Samuel, but they are also not the chosen ones. Neither are the four other sons that Jesse brings after. Jesse, uh, if I'm Jesse, I'm losing a little bit of hope here. One of my sons is, is the next king, but it's, it's not any of these seven. Um, Who's left, right? There's one more son, the youngest and of such little consequence. Jesse was so convinced that he would not be the chosen one that he left him with the sheep. He didn't invite him to be present for the anointing of the king. The sheep needed tending. Jesse, are all of your sons here? Are they all here? The beginning of the text for today starts by asking Samuel a question. How long will you grieve over Saul? I've rejected him as king. He is not the leader for my people Israel. He is not the anointed one you are looking for. Samuel, take your fear and your assumptions and let them go. Samuel must be feeling a little defeated a little scared. After all, Saul still is the king. Not only were none of the sons who were fit to be king chosen, but the one who remained wasn't invited. Samuel didn't even know about David until Jesse remembered that there was one more kid. He just happened to be tending the flocks. Oops. In the ancient Near East, the shepherd was a symbol of the king, so ancient audiences would have been touched by this irony in the story for today, that the one they thought was too insignificant to even be invited to the anointing ceremony, to even be invited to the sacrifice, was the one who would be chosen to tend not a flock of sheep, but the flock of people Israel. Rise and anoint him. He is the one. Note that in this scripture, Samuel never speaks to David. The parallels to this story and to Saul's story are striking. Samuel anoints both of them. Both are young and unassuming. Both are chosen by God, but Saul has been unfaithful to God's command. There's general anxiety around both kings. What if it happens again? We've done this before. Will they be able to lead the people in the way they should go? What about themselves? Will they themselves be faithful to God? David, as a king, is so unassuming that First Chronicles doesn't even list him as a son of Jesse. In Chronicles, Jesse is said to only have the seven sons, not the seven rejected and David the eighth. Though it's not the best choice lineage-wise, David is not the choice of the youngest well, this would be the norm for God. Remember, God chose Isaac over Ishmael, God chose Jacob over es Esau, and God chose Gideon over his older brothers. God raises up over and over and over again someone of low status. A shepherd, the youngest of eight, who wasn't even considered a viable candidate to bring before Samuel. The short story plays on the contrast between seeing and hearing. The chapter's key word, see, is again in play. In verse 7 alone, the word see or look is listed five times. The problem is that Samuel is relying on the human sense of vision, which won't cut it for the work of God. Previously in 1 Samuel, Samuel had referred to himself as a literal seer. But in this text, the task wasn't to see so much as it was to listen. You shall anoint the one I name to you. The text uses the same Hebrew verb to say or to name in each case when the brothers Eliab, Abinadab, Shema, and David are all presented. The message is clear. When dealing with matters of God's actions and God's will, human sight 
is a woefully inadequate tool. The human sense of hearing, if we need a sense, and if we are actually listening, is what tends to be preferable to the God of the Old Testament. And the dimension of the test, text seems to ring loudly in our own cultural context. We rely on our sight for almost everything, but it often proves untrustworthy. Advertisers know the quickest way to get their fingers into our wallets is through our eyes, bombarding us with images of fame, wealth, and excess. Do we really think having the same things as advertisers put on celebrities will make us more attractive and successful? Maybe not. Maybe we tell ourselves not, but we still buy the things. The cars, the clothes, the hamburgers, the watches, we still buy the things. We tend to pick our leaders, humans as a general group, politicians, principals, coaches, celebrities, based on society's norms about appearances. For the last century or more, the taller of the two presidential candidates has almost always won. And unless we in the church think that we've risen above our standards, we need to look at ourselves in a mirror, look at the global leaders of especially the Methodist church, and say, are we really that different? We're trying, but are we really that different yet? Our pews, our seminaries are filled with cis, white, straight human beings. The majority of them are still male. How do we look beyond our appearances? The Lord does not see as mortals see, Mortals see based on outward appearances. The Lord looks with the heart. Thanks be to God. Amen.